Today we're wrapping up this sermon series for the last couple of months on Paul's letter to the Philippians, Christians in the city of Philippi. The sermon series has been all about living a life of vision. We've been focusing not only on our vision as a church, but Paul's vision throughout this letter of the future God had in store for him. The future of being with Christ in heaven, in the kingdom of God, face to face. And it's that vision that gave Paul joy throughout some of his deepest trials. Today what I want to do is simply take a few moments to reflect on the concluding portion of the letter that I'm going to read in a moment, just share a few thoughts about that joy that got Paul through his trials and that kept Paul focused on the kingdom of God. Before I read, let us pray. Holy God, we pray that by this word of yours this morning, you would restore to us the joy of your salvation in Christ. That you would, through your word, drive out the distractions, our disappointments, our struggles, the things that occupy our mind this morning that would keep us from having joy. We ask that you do this through Christ. Amen. So I'm reading today from Philippians chapter 4, 4 through 9. It's right before the end of the letter. Most of Paul's letters, he ends with a series of greetings to specific people. So I'm, we're not going to go into that part. This is sort of the conclusion of, of what he really wants to say to his readers. Chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Again, this is the word of the Lord. Rejoice, Paul says, always. And then he says it again. Rejoice, always. Joy has been the great theme of this entire letter that we've been studying, which is remarkable because Paul wrote this letter while he was in prison with an uncertain future, knowing that at any moment the Romans could decide to have him executed. And yet he writes constantly about joy. This joy that sustained him, this joy that again came from knowing the future that God had in store for him. Earlier, a few weeks ago, we read the, the portion of the letter where Paul said, Whether I live or die, I will rejoice because I belong to the Lord. It doesn't matter if I live or die. Either way, I gain Christ. And everything else is a loss compared to that. He knew what God wanted for him, and that gave him joy. Do you know, this morning, that God wants you to have joy? <clears throat> that God wants you to have joy. Not that God hopes you will happen to have joy if the circumstances are right. God doesn't just hope things work out the way you want them to. God doesn't just hope that you're vaguely happy. God wants you to have joy. Not passively, but actively. Through Christ, God is literally dying to make sure that you have joy. You 
You see, sometimes, even though we might say, well, sure, it makes sense, I guess, that God wants me to have joy. Really what we're thinking in the back of our minds is that maybe God is, is out to get us. That God doesn't really want us to be happy. We think that way, especially when things are going quite poorly in our lives. Right? Some of you are in situations right now where it's hard to believe that God wants you to have joy. Because something has happened to take your happiness away. It happens when... Suddenly we're not as healthy as we thought we were when the doctor gives us some news. It happens when we are doing our best to care for our aging parents. It happens when there's a tragedy and it disrupts the way that our family works. We lose a loved one and we go through grief. All kinds of different things that can happen to our lives and it makes us think, does God really want me to be happy? Does God really want me to have joy? Because it doesn't feel like it right now. Other times we think the same way when we're facing a, a choice. Maybe we have a few options, where to go to school, what job to get, or maybe some other kind of choice, and one of them seems just perfect. Boy, that would, that's everything I ever wanted. The other one we know would be a challenge, and it'd be difficult. And sometimes we think to ourselves, well, I really want that one, but maybe, maybe that means God wants me to have the hard one, because isn't that just like God to test me? There's something difficult, right? It couldn't be that God just wants me to have joy. But he does. God wants you to have joy. God is not out to get you. God is not out to test you, to make you miserable. God wants you to have joy. And Paul wants us to understand how we come about that joy. What's interesting is that he doesn't say how to have joy. He actually explains how not to go about finding joy. He has this great sentence. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Now, what does gentleness have to do with joy? I guess they maybe go together. Gentleness is a nice quality. But the word that's behind that English word, gentleness, can be translated a few different ways, and its larger meaning would be something more like forbearance, which means not insisting on your own rights. Not insisting on getting what you want. That's what Paul says. Let this quality be evident to everyone that you are not going to insist on getting what you want. Paul is saying... Rejoice. Have joy. God wants you to have joy, but it's not going to happen by just getting what you want. Getting what you want is not the way to find joy. At least it's not a guarantee of finding joy. See, sometimes this is what we do. We think, well, I would be joyful if, right? We qualify joy. I would be joyful if certain things happened, if I got better, if I got healthier if my children would find their way in life and make better choices. If I didn't have to deal with this problem at work and these co-workers that drive me crazy, whatever it is, if I could just change this, then I would have joy. Paul says that's not how it works. It's not about insisting on your rights. It's not about getting what you want. That's not how you find joy. So how do you find joy? Well, that's his next sentence. And it's four simple words. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. In Psalm 145, it was our call to worship this morning. It says, the Lord is near to all who call on him in truth. There's another psalm in scripture that says, where can I go from God's presence? In other words, if I tried to run away from God, I couldn't. Because wherever I go, I would find that God is there with me. The Lord is is near. Paul says that is the source of your joy. It's not in getting what you want or having a certain situation be changed to what you want. It's not getting your wish. Joy comes from knowing that the Lord is near even when you don't have what you want. A colleague of mine, a pastor who was actually also a good mentor of mine, once during a sabbatical, he traveled to Egypt in an effort to find God. He's 
felt like he was sort of getting lost in his work as a pastor and just felt like God was far away. And he thought, well, some of the ancient desert fathers, some of those great saints, they went into the desert and that's where they found God. So he went to the desert in Egypt and stayed in this, this monastery and after a few days of almost going crazy from the solitude, he had this moment when he felt God was speaking to him and what God said was, you didn't have to come to the desert to find him. <laughs> God said very clearly, I am right here. I am as near to you as the beating of your own heart, and I always have been. God is not somewhere else. God is not just somewhere down the road in your future, and if only you could maybe be a better Christian, then you'll, you'll have your encounter with God. God is not in another physical place. If I move to a new house, move to a new job, move to whatever... God is not somewhere else. God is near to you. He's here. Because here is the only place we can ever be. We are creatures that are limited by time and space. Here is the only option we have. If you go there, there will become here. You're only ever here. Which is where God will always meet you. Because it's the only place you are. God is here, now. Not there and later. God is here and now. That is where you will always find God. The Lord is near, Paul says. That is why you should have joy. And not only joy. Very quickly, Paul moves into another benefit that's tied directly to joy. Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything because the Lord is near, because you are joyful. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Peace is what you will have in knowing that God is near. And I love the way that Paul talks about this, because he says, present your requests to God. If you have something you want, if you have something that you need, some situation you're in that you can't handle, Paul says, pray about it. Bring that request to God, but not to get what you want. Again, getting what you want isn't what brings joy. Paul doesn't say, present your requests and God will give you the exact thing that you're praying for every time. He doesn't say, present your requests so that God will fix your life in the way you think it should be. He says, present your requests because then you will have peace. You may not get the healing you ask for. You may not get the money, the financial support that you need with whatever you're going through. You may not see your kids change their behavior the way you think they should. You may not get exactly what you're asking for, but if you pray, when you pray and present your requests to God, you get peace that passes understanding. The peace of knowing that God is near to you, that God hears your prayers and that peace will guard your hearts and your minds. And really, that's what we're after, isn't it? That peace of just knowing that God is near. We don't need our problem to be fixed as much as we think we do. What we need is God. God's own presence. And that's exactly what God gives us. I remember when Melody and I moved to Pittsburgh so that I could start seminary. First couple of times I got sick, you know, got a cold, got sinus infections, things like that. We went to this urgent care that was right across the river from the seminary. And I was used to going to the doctor, and when you say you're sick, they give you antibiotics. You go home, you take them, you get better. So I went to the doctor, I said, okay, I've got a cold, I've got a sinus infection. And he said, okay, well, it'll probably take two or three weeks, but it'll probably get better on its own. And I, I don't want to prescribe antibiotics because it's better if your body heals itself. Thanks. <laughs> I walked out of there so frustrated. You're a doctor. I came to you asking for what I need to fix my problem, and you didn't give me the prescription. That's all I needed was a prescription. I would have taken it away faster, maybe better faster, and you didn't give it to me. How dare you? Sometimes we go to God and we want a prescription. God, this is what I need, and I know what the solution is, and sometimes we really do. I know what would fix this problem, and God says... I'm not going to give you that prescription. I'm going to give you my peace. 
peace of knowing that even if you are still sick, even if this problem persists for the rest of your life, I am with you, and that is all you truly need to have joy. God gives us his peace, and that is always better than a prescription. Joy and peace in God's presence. That is what God wants for you. That is God's vision for your life. Not just in the future, not just in heaven, but here and now. Joy and peace in the presence of God. Now that, that is certainly enough. That is enough good news to celebrate, to talk about this morning. But Paul wants to go a little further because Paul is like some of us. He's very type A. And he's a very practical man. So he wants to talk about this, this wonderful joy and peace that God promises to you. But then he wants to add a little note about well, here's some practical ways to, to keep you on that road to that joy and that peace. Here's some practical ways to seek that joy and that peace. And this is what he says. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Another little translation thing here, that word think, again, that's one way to translate it, but there's a deeper meaning behind the word that Paul uses, and it's not just think about these things, it's a word that's often used for measurements. Paul says, measure by these things. Measure your life by these things. Pay attention, careful attention like you would if you're measuring something. Pay attention to these things, to what is noble, to what is right, to what is pure, and so on. Don't waste your time measuring your life by other units of success that don't really matter. How much money, how many promotions. Or measuring, measuring your life by your failures, your mistakes, the bad things that have happened. Do not Pay attention to those things. If you're going to take stock of your life, measure your life. Don't measure those things. Measure these things. What is noble? What is right? What is pure? What is lovely? What is excellent? What is praiseworthy? Think about, measure, pay attention to such things because all of these things are signs of God's presence with you. That's how we notice the presence of God. It's not in our mistakes and our failures. It's not in the things we think we need God to do to fix our problems. It's in these qualities in us and in the world around us and in other people. Pay attention to these things, Paul says. Measure your life by these things. Because they are signs of God's presence with you. And when you're paying attention to God's presence, when you measure your life by the presence of God within it, you will have peace and you will have joy. Which is not only what you want, it's what God wants for you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.